Hi, and welcome to the Cisco Network Services Orchestrator session. I'm Jason Belk. My partner in crime is Hank Preston. Just at a high level for this session, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey. And then we're going to go into the NSO architecture, some nuts and bolts in terms of what is the product we're even talking about. I'm going to have a demo that's more of a CLI focus. And Hank's going to take us in a more advanced feature set within Cisco NSO, including the APIs and some of the CLI. And so I, I started at Cisco many moons ago as an intern came back at Cisco IT. I was a network engineer. And so we were ripping out old hardware, putting in new hardware, doing cases on call for the campus and branch team. We had over 600 sites, thousands of network devices, being on call, you know, lots of great camaraderie with my teammates there, love the management, had a great time. But also I think as the years went by, the toil of having to keep the configuration consistent on thousands of network devices across hundreds of sites got to be a lot more than you know our team could handle. And, and so we wanted to go more and more into automation, more than just the Perl, Bash, and Python scripts that we had had of old. And you can see some pictures here. We have, I think it's a CAT 7200 on one side I was ripping out and an ASR kit 1K on the other side. Um, so so I'll, I'll just go through a couple of the phases of my transition and why this gets me so excited about Cisco NSO. As a network engineer, I was not aware of the product until I was just getting started in automation. I was a network engineer trying to figure things out, familiar with the Cisco command line because we had obviously primarily Cisco products <laughs> in the Cisco network. And that led me into learning for myself, Python, Ansible, you know, eventually moving into Cisco NSO, because we were all within our team facing the struggles of what I think network engineer, engineers across the board see in terms of trying to keep on, keep on top of all the configuration of our network devices. Um, and one of the things I really liked about Cisco NSO was that it allowed kind of our whole team to work together on our automation products, where you can see on the picture on the right there, we have kind of my core automation team, Bal and Kevin in the middle, who are college new hires, then James Kern on the right, who is a rock star from TAC, who's in our operations team, um, also as a network engineer. And so what we were able to do with Cisco NSO was have our kind of fresh out of college grads treat the network as code, more or less, using NSO as the abstraction that we were able to work with. And then James and I were able to guide them in terms of what data we were looking for when we were, because NSO is a configuration management tool. We'll talk about that a little bit more on, on the architecture side, but all that to say is we were able to work on our own doing automation, but also bring in new people who didn't have a lot of network domain expertise quite yet, but they were able to visually see through the Python API and, and, and through the other ways NSO interacts, how to change the network without even understanding all, all the underlying details. And our main kind of capstone projects with, with that team was to do an OS upgrader where we had 30 different hardware platforms just within our iOS devices. And we used Cisco NSO as our automation platform to then integrate NSO with ServiceNow, with our Flask app, to have a web GUI for people to go in there and, and provision their own you know, OS upgrades. Because we were on a quarterly basis having to keep up with all the P certs on our thousands of devices and using NSO and, and this OS upgrade that we had built within NSO um, really helped us as an automation team come together and, and be able to continue to execute effectively. And that, that's what got, really got me excited about network automation and about NSO specifically initially was coming out of the networking space, knowing only the command line really, and some maybe basic Python from my undergrad, <laughs> is NSO allowed me as a network engineer to learn the, basically the trade, you'll see that the command line interface when we get to the demo is very similar to a Cisco command line interface. And as you understand the application model, and as you kind of grow in your skills for Python, REST APIs, and other skills that automation often includes, kind of that domain knowledge you're learning of the application on the command line then easily transfers to the APIs as your other skills increase. Any, any questions on those first couple of slides before I Move on, okay. And, and then I joined Network to Code after building automation with NSO, learned more Ansible, and saw that the struggles I was facing as an individual really were across the board in the industry. And I had a great time there with Network to Code in terms of 
teaching other engineers how to get started with Ansible, Python, and, and the other common automation technologies. And, and so I'd highly recommend Network to Code if anybody's looking for consulting and training for network automation. Uh, but on top of that, just I'd say that experience kind of solidified my understanding of what the industry is facing as a whole, not just within my little microcosm of Cisco IT. And that has led me into my current role as an automation evangelist, where I'm doing stuff like this, going out there, sharing people why I think Cisco NSO is valuable for network engineers to learn and why the tools and skills that they'll be doing when they're working with NSO are going to serve them, not just for this product only, but within the industry as a whole. So from a product perspective, what, what is NSO in the industry? We have over 200 customers and we support pretty much every OS known to humankind, which I think is a really special thing, especially, especially for a Cisco product, is that we have multi-vendor support, true multi-vendor support across the board for pretty much any device type you're gonna see. And we have scaled up to hundreds of thousands of devices for the largest service providers in the world. And also worked with enterprises who have maybe less devices, but just lots of complex changes that they want to configure. And so, so I'd say NSO is even though it's something that's not as top of mind when people hear about network automation, it's been around for I think almost a decade. And CompD, the product behind it, has been around for over a decade. And so it's been well, well proven, well tested, seen in production at scale. And so what we're showing you here, even though some of the demos might be just for one specific use case. It's been used in a lot of different arenas, both in the service provider side and then also on the enterprise. So the NSO architecture, really at the heart and soul of the product is what's called the CDB, it, the configuration database. NSO as a configuration management platform needs to understand what's on the network. So it logs into all the devices that are added into its device list, gathers the running config, gathers show version, you know, the, the common commands to get a snapshot of what the devices are, and then discards those running configs. It doesn't keep the raw text files. It actually goes through the hard work of parsing every line of configuration and then mapping that to an internal data model within the CDB. And you can think of that from a network engineering perspective that it doesn't just have raw text files. It allows you to have a complete understanding of where each input of your configuration would go and all the possible features, um, which for me as a network engineer was mind blowing because most of the products out there that interact with configuration just allow you to edit the raw text files. And if you have a spelling error and indentation error, for those of us who worked with Jinja 2 and YAML, it can be stressful <laughs> to try to troubleshoot in all, all those types of errors. And because NSO is doing the heavy lifting of parsing all the configuration for you, and then you're just doing manipulations onto a local parsed copy, it then re-renders the commands you need when you make changes. So you're not actually ever having to worry about indentation issues, spelling issues. The, these device abstractions have all the possible commands available to you, and then it renders the correct commands for you. So, Jason? Yes. Uh, you are doing great, by the way. Thank you. Uh, so uh, in the beginning, you showed us also some books, right? Just in yes. the previous slide. But um, I seen there a couple Ansible books. Now you were talking about the uh, NSO. You just started, but uh, yeah. I, I wonder when uh, those YAML you you mentioned and in then the indentation also you said. So if we talk about the uh, Ansible versus NSO a little bit yeah. at least, uh, because many people probably would do that comparison yeah. anyway. Sure. Uh, what would you say if one of them? I think this one. So. Uh, probably configuration will be much more easier, you will say. Uh, we will be uh, hiding lots of complexity, et cetera. But what else you will uh, also say? Maybe this is a very uh, early, if it's- uh, Yeah, no, no, no. And, and, and I know both tools very well because I've taught both of them. Uh, so the way Ansible works in, in my experience for network configuration is kind of one of three ways. You either have one, where you're using the Ansible module, say like if an interface module and you provide the parameters and then it sends over the configuration. The second way I'd see Ansible used is with some type of replace the whole config with a text file, typically with Napalm or you have a source file for Ansible. So for that one, you wanna have your entire text file typed out ahead of time and then it's shipped over to the device. And, and I'd say the third, way Ansible is used to configure network devices is through different orchestrators. 
Um, so what, whether that's NSO, DNA Center, ACI, they all have Ansible modules. So one way you can use Ansible is actually to configure NSO. <laughs> and so we have a better together story in that sense, in, in that we, we use NSO, we use Ansible to as a API kind of interaction to talk to NSO and, and to make NSO transactions. But I think what you're talking about is doing an apples to apples comparison of I'm using Ansible to configure my network or I'm using NSO to configure my network with nothing in between. Yeah, um, configuration management. And, 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 and I would say for that particular example, you're gonna need some type of handcrafted data model where, where you're, you're defining a YAML file. You're saying my interface is colon, and then I have all of my interface inputs and that's some Jinja 2 templates that are gonna represent um, where those variables are gonna get plugged in. And, and so I, in, in my experience, it, it, that level of maintenance initially is pretty easy to set up. You, you just kind of copy and paste your text file and plug in the variables, but over time, it's a lot to maintain because you're having to basically maintain a snapshot of the configuration for all your devices in, in a text file per device across a Git repo. And, and that's definitely better than doing it manually, but I'd say the, those text files have no knowledge of what is actually on the device. Those text files are just things on the disk that you represent a snapshot of the configuration. Um, and if you spell interface wrong or you type, mistype an IP address and have an extra period, uh, you know, there's, there's ways to get around that in terms of adding Jinja 2 filters and verifying things. But I'd say overall, you're going to start running, running into kind of tedious issues in trying to, trying to replicate configuration in text files that and those text files are decoupled from the actual network devices. Where, where NSO behind the scenes ha has what we call data model validation for all the inputs. So if you mistype interface, it will tell you that's that's a misspelled word. Or if you mistype gigabit ethernet or 10 gigabit ethernet, it's gonna, it's gonna validate all of those inputs. If you have an IP address and you put an extra period, it's gonna know that particular input is supposed to be an IP address. Just like when you're typing in the actual router, router it will tell you those errors. So NSO provides you that validation before you're actually even building your automation to be able to validate what your inputs are. And, and, and that also gives us a lot of extra bells and whistles from a programmability perspective, being able to have a more granular way to configure our network using the Python API and things like that. And, and, and I'd say one other thing I want to highlight for this is that all the features that NSO has are exposed over every single API it offers. And so, so I, I'd say this is one of the, the other things that really excited me about NSO when I was getting started is that as I learned how to configure NSO and devices on the CLI, that understanding reinforced as I started to learn the Python API and, and REST API and, and the other components is sometimes you're, you're learning a, a product or platform. And then as you're learning one portion of it, you kind of have to start over again when you start learning the APIs or something else, there's, there's a disconnect in how they're designed. But the way NSO is designed is that there's feature parity across all of, all of the different ways of interacting with the application. So that's, that's for me, at least really huge. Um, now, like we said, we have multi-domain physical and virtual infrastructure. So we're not just talking about Cisco devices, even that's what we're showing today. We have across the board, you know, Resto, Juniper down the line. So the device manager is, is basically just the simplest way of interacting with network devices through NSO, where you have either a single device or a group of devices, and then you're working with a snapshot of the configuration in the CDB, and then whatever changes you make, those are then, it generates the proper set of commands to send to the devices. Um, and then it also calculates the rollback for you. So I, I know Napalm and other technologies have rollback, but those are on box features that you have to enable or you're just sitting over a text file of the last known config, where what we have here is an intelligent rollback in the sense where it actually calculates for every change you make, the sequence of commands you need to revert that set of configuration, which as we know for especially Cisco devices, sometimes rolling back a change is more than just saying no interface. <laughs> you know, ha having multi-steps rolled back for VPNs or, or, or other configurations are definitely really helpful to have especially for network engineers who are getting started in automation, you wanna be able to back out of something just as quickly as you went into it sometimes. So this is my last slide before we jump into the demo, just to reinforce that at, even though the features I'm gonna be showing from NSO are not the most mind blowing in terms of automation, it's, it's, it's really exciting for me because it shows the basic features of how 
NSO works. And then as those features are reinforced for people, we have learning labs, we have DevNet sandboxes. I'll be going through the DevNet sandbox in our demo. Those then help network engineers understand how all the pieces fit together. So as they learn Python and Java or Java, if they want, <laughs> and other automation tools, even Ansible talking to NSO, it, it, it give, gives them the mental framework to understand how all the pieces fit together for NSO. And, and so one of the things I really like about using NSO is that the sky's the limit in terms of what you can do eventually, because some tools, they have a certain ceiling in terms of complexity and what they can handle. NSO has a, a learning curve, I'll say, but it also has a lower learning curve in the sense that a network engineer can get started and, and play around with the CLI and, and kind of figure out how things are going on. And then eventually, as they're more comfortable, start diving into more of the APIs.